IIT Gandhinagar. He did his PhD from NCBS TIFR. He was postdoctoral fellow at Chemical Biology Institute, Curie, Paris. He received many awards and fellowships during this tenure. Among the list is Curie Postdoctoral Fellowship, Human Frontiers Science Program, EMBU and FRM Postdoctoral Fellowship, Laboratories of Excellence LabEx Fellow. Currently, he is DST Ramanujan Fellow and he has received DBT Ramalinga Swami Fellowship as well. He is teaching Bio Nanotechnology and Science of Stem Cells to undergraduate and postgraduate students at IIT Gandhinagar. He is also external member of Institute Biosafety Committee. His major area of research is DNA nanotechnology based approaches to cell and chemical biology. He is working on programmable DNA nano devices for biomedical purposes, immunotherapy, bioimaging and biosensing. I welcome you sir. Uh, may I request yeah, Dr. Dhiraj yeah. Bhatia to take over? Yeah. Thank sure. You, thank you. Okay. So, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I will just share my screen now uh, quickly. Uh, th first of all, uh, thank you, Professor Anjali Avasti, for this kind invitation. And uh, I hope uh, I am audible to everybody. And uh, is my screen visible? Like, can you see my screen now? Uh, yes. Yes. It's, okay. It's visible. Okay. Great. Perfect. So, so uh, without uh, spending much time, let's uh, begin about today's topic. Uh, first of all, uh, sincere thanks everyone for joining and uh, once again, thank you for the invitation. Uh, uh, my expertise are, as Professor Anjali said, uh, in being in nanotechnology. So we use every day uh, these two primary technologies, which is this polymerase chain reaction, PCR and uh, gene sequencing. And uh, I thought that these topics are kind of relevant at this moment for everybody uh, in the country and the world. Like given that we are going through this COVID-19 pandemic, uh, like the only way at this moment by which we're detecting the viral RNA or the presence of this coronavirus in the body samples is through this PCR uh, technology. So uh, made a bit more relevant to talk to the general audience. So let me quickly start with the PCR, the first part, polymerase chain reaction. And in the second half, I will talk about the gene sequencing. So, uh, and uh, if there is any uh, question, maybe uh, you can drop it in the messages and maybe Professor Anjali can coordinate and I will be happy to answer the questions. So, uh, in general, like let's say for the general people or the general uh, uh, layman summary, PCR is nothing but a Xerox machine. Ki hum log, like when we want to multiply the number of copies of the paper, we put it on a Xerox machine and this machine produces more and more copies of the paper. Similarly, we do the Xerox machining or the polymerase chain reaction on DNA, which is like a genetic material of the human body. And if you want to multiply it into multiple copies, we use this technique called as polymerase chain reaction, which in molecular biology amplifies or you can say multiplies a single copy or very few copies of the segments of DNA by orders of magnitude, generating millions of copies of that particular DNA sequence. Okay. And uh, so uh, just briefly, this technique was invented by Terry Mullis uh, in 1983. And these days it has become like a common technique in the research laboratories, testing facilities. And uh, this got Mullis uh, the Nobel Prize in chemistry uh, in 1993. And then... The subsequent techniques which came out, which is the gene sequencing, Sanger's method, Illumina, they all are based on the basic principle of the PCR, that is multiplication of the DNA, and now the RNA as well. So, um, uh, is my speed okay, or am I going too fast? Um, Sir, you can uh, go a little bit slower. Okay, if it's fine, okay with fine, you. Thank you. Yeah, no, 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 thank you. Uh, yes. So, um, okay, basically, you. like if we look at any technique or any method, uh, it has three components to it. Like, what is the purpose? Like, why are we interested in this particular technique? And how to do it? Like, what are the conditions uh, involved in doing it? And what are the components involved in any technique? So, I will cover the same principles for the PCR. That what is the purpose of the PCR? What are the conditions under which we can do PCR and what are the different components involved, right? So, to amplify, like the purpose of our D, uh, uh, PCR is to multiply or make the Xerox copies of the DNA to amplify a lot of double-stranded DNA molecules 
with same size and sequence by enzymatic method and cycling condition okay so like enzyme makes a copy and you can keep repeating the cycle in the same single test tube to make hundreds and thousands of copies of the pieces of the dna and to do this like how you need a proper xerox machine which can read the paper like it can scan the paper and make a copy of it and print it similarly we need some components in the pcr the major components and we did are the magnesium because that is the one which is needed for the enzyme you need a proper alkaline buffer like around 8.3 to 8.8 for this enzyme to work you need nucleotides <clears throat> like we all know that dna is made from the nucleotides so if you want to assemble the dna in a test tube you need the building blocks which are this nucleotide there are four types of nucleotides a t g c which can form the dna and there are the small strands of the dna which are the primers so these are the nucleus like they will they, these are the small pieces of the dna which will stick to the main dna and then the polymerase will sit on those primers and it will read the sequence and make the new dna i will show the methodology which we used and the main component is the dna polymerase which is the enzyme which can keep adding the nucleotides on those dna primer and the original sequence the target dna sequence which we need to multiply in the test tube okay so these are the basic simple chemical components which are needed in the pcr technology so uh, for finding like uh, to make it uh, i have kept it bit general but i assume that all of the students know the i hope you all know that like the dna is a duplex uh, made up of the nucleotides a t g c where a binds to t and g binds to c i i assume that this uh, basic knowledge is known to the students and then i am covering only the the pcr techniques okay so now what are the main requirements for the pcr so the first is uh, the dna sequence or the target which you want to amplify now this must be known most of the time we take it from the plasmids or from the human genome and we should know at least the region of it to which the primers are going to bind and these days we have the softwares the pub, there are ncba softwares where all the gene sequences of all the genes are deposited so you can easily go to the ncba for example if you want to dig any gene and if you want to amplify it from the human cells or from the uh, using the plasmids you can just go to the ncba put the name of your gene and it will give you the sequences of the target gene and all of them are known at this moment so the dna sequence of the target region must be known now once you know the sequence of the main uh, target dna then you need to design small primers which will bind to one particular region of it so these primers are synthetic dna you can make them in the laboratory like if you have a solid phase dna synthesizer you can synthesize these small pieces of the dna in the laboratory or these days many commercial companies provide uh, these primers you can just place an order with sigma allrich or any other company and you will get in 2 3 days the piece of the dna so these are called as uh, primers which are typically 20 to 30 bases in the size so these can be ready to produce by the commercial companies or we can make them in the laboratory if we have the dna synthesizer facility then we need the thermostable dna polymerase now when i say thermostable like on, there are very few examples of the enzymes so enzymes are the proteins which can catalyze the reaction and we all know from basic biology from the 11th and 12th or basic biology that every protein has a temperature range like the enzymes or the proteins they work only at a particular temperature range out of which they will not be functional or they will uh, defold or unfold right so this enzyme which was discovered uh, in thermophilus bacteria that is a tac polymerase this is one of the very very uh, thermostable enzyme that is it is not inactivated even by heating at 95 degrees celsius and we need these high temperatures to unfold the long pieces of the dna so remember dna is like a double stranded uh, helix structure and in order for it for the pcr to run you have to first unfold the dna and this unfolding happens at a very high temperatures and this enzyme is much much stable even at those temperatures and then later you need like a machine a thermocycler machine which can automatically change the temperatures so the machine that can be programmed to carry out heating and cooling of the samples over the number of cycles okay 
So these are some of the examples. Like, I'm sure many of you must have seen these machines, or uh, some of you must have even used these machines. So this is a heating block, like a thermo uh, thermocycler uh, device. And yeah, here you have a sample chamber where you can put like a 96 well plate, or even now those small tubes, PCI tubes. Here you can see some of them. Like you can put your tubes, cover it, and then give the program of the temperatures, and then the machine will automatically keep changing the temperatures. Like it will increase and decrease the temperatures based on the timings that you give. And I will show you some examples. So what are the conditions or the steps involved in the PCI? The first step is to unfold the DNA. So as I said, that the DNA in the human body or in the cells or even in the plasmids occurs in a double standard helical nature and you have to first unfold it for it to be read by the enzyme. So first step is the denaturation of the double standard DNA template which happens at around 95 degrees Celsius. Then second thing is the small primers to go and stick to those uh, target DNA strands. Now this has to happen at a lower temperature. Like you cannot do it at the 95 degrees because the the binding is so weak that if you increase the temperature, this, this primer will come off. So you have to do this lower temperature. And then the third step is the extension. So the moment those primers are bound on the DNA, you have to keep adding the nucleotides to build the full DNA sequence. Uh, here is a simple example or the schematic of it. So let's say you have the target DNA from the cells or from the plasmid or anywhere from the source. And this is a classical double standard DNA. Okay, now we put it in a tube and we put it in the machine and we give this temperature 92 or 94 degrees Celsius. What will happen at this temperature is that this Watson and Crick base pairing will start to dissolve, it will denature, and you will get two single standard DNA separated. Okay, this process is called as a denaturation, happens at a very high temperatures above 90 degrees. Second is the annealing step. So this, as I said, happens at a lower temperature, like close to 50 degrees. Most of the time, the temperatures are much, much lower, depending upon the length of the primer. So the smaller the primer, the lower the temperature for it to bind properly to the DNA. So this is called as the annealing temperature. Depends on the melting temperature of the expected duplex. And once you do this step, you mix the small primers and the double standard DNA tube, denature the DNA, and then decrease the temperature. So what will happen is these small pieces of the DNA, which are called as the primers, they will sit or they will bind the target DNA. A five prime to three prime of the plasmid will be the, sorry, of the primer will be this one, and it will go and form the watson creek base pairing, which is the target DNA. And the same thing will happen for this primer. So this is called as a forward primer, like this will run in this direction, of the DNA synthesis, and this is called as a reverse primer. That is from the parent DNA, it will come from three prime to five prime DNA. So this will grow like this, and this primer will grow like this. So this is called as the annealing step. And the third step is the extension step. So remember, I told you that along with the target DNA and the primer, we also need to add DNTPs, which are the building blocks of the DNA, the nucleotide sequences. So what happens is this is a pool of DNTP. So ATP, TTP, GTP, CTP, those are the uh, nucleotides which are present in the solution. And this enzyme, the TAC polymerase or the DNA polymerase binds to the annealed primers and extends the DNA at the three prime end of this chain. So remember here it was the five prime and the three prime. So the primer will be opposite. So here it will be five prime to three prime. And the polymerase will keep on adding single, single nucleotide on this. And this chain will keep on growing. And this is called as the extension. And once this full chain is grown, the polymerase comes off and you get a full double standard DNA. So this is a classical um, uh, um, uh, scenario or classical PCR looks like. So you begin with the first step, which is this denaturation step. Then you bring down the temperatures immediately. So this is the annealing step around 50 degrees where the primer binds. Second step is the extension where the polymerase keeps on adding those nucleotides to the primer DNA. And the, again, you will have a denaturation step to go into the second cycle. Now, what happens is PCR. Like if you do this one cycle, you will get two copies of the DNA. In one cycle, you will double the number of DNA. But normally, when we do the experiments, you need a lot of uh, copies of the DNA. So you can't keep doing this manually. But, uh, one good thing is in the PCR machine, there is something called as a program. 
So you can mention this program that we eat it for five minutes, then do this for thirty minutes, this fifteen minutes, and again five minutes, and then repeat it for thirty times or forty times, and the machine will keep doing it automatically. So it will make the DNA. In denature it again, add the primers again, extend it and again denature it. So this is an automatic phenomenon which is happening in the thermocycle, and hence the PCR keeps on going. So this is the product of the extension. Like we started with one copy of the double stranded DNA, and at the end of one cycle of PCR, we got two copies of the DNA. Right. So we made a Xerox copy of the DNA using PCR. now what happens is this was the one copy of the dna and if you keep doing the pcr cycle again and again so you will get multiple copies of this. here is the example so you start with the single piece or single copy of the double stranded dna you do it first cycle okay from one dna you got two copies of the dna again this will go undergo another cycle in the second cycle so at the end of the two cycles you got four pieces of the dna right then 8 16 32 like this so if you do this 35 times cycle 35 cycles of the pcr at the end of the pcr from one single copy of the duplex dna you will get 68 billion copies of the dna right so this is a very very high like exponential amplification of the dna by the pcr and that is needed when we are talking about detections of the viral rna uh, when we talk about having dna samples for the molecular biology gene editing uh, biochemistry applications you need a lot of quantity of the dna and pcr is the most convenient method to get dna into large quantities from very small amount of the dna right and can somebody tell me on what factor will this number depend like when will this stop anyone any guess like maybe we can break for a minute um, can anybody tell me what is the limiting factor in this cycle of the pcr hello uh, tag tag polymerase enzyme tag polymerase enzyme how about the quantity of the ntps because see we are adding the ntps yeah, that, that will be after, um, after particular time the amount of ntps they, which are there the building blocks they will all be consumed right and once all the ntps are consumed you don't have any more building block to multiply further right so ntps are the limiting factor uh, which yes, is very true right okay very true so so am i clear is this concept clear of the pcr uh, that how does this works in the four cycles to make multiple copies of the dna yes sir you are explaining it very well basic principle of the pcr so let's yes, move sir. yeah yeah let's move a little bit further now now that was something which was detected in 1993 the simple process of four steps of multiplying or making the xerox copies of the dna and then came lot of variations like you, you remember like this is a classical um, uh, cycle maybe so this takes roughly like advantages of the pcr is that you start with very small amount of dna and then result obtains are quickly usually 4 to 6 hours of pcr time so if you remember these days when the sample of the saliva from the patient is given for the uh, coronavirus rna detection it takes roughly 6 hours because the process which people use is pcr based i will come to it that how will we use pcr to diagnose the coronavirus rna i will come to it in a minute and initially in the olden days people used to use this radioactive material and all nowadays you don't need it you can easily do it for uh, without using any radioactive material or hazardous materials right and it's much more precise to determine the size of the alleles or mutations or any diseases which are there due to the changes in the dna right so these are some of the advantages of the polymerase chain reaction and this was all like discovered in 93 and it was used for long time and we all know that every technology gets um, innovated like if you remember most of us like when we were studying there was only one blue color nokia mobile uh, which many of us had then came some other reliance mobile then samsung mobile then uh, iphones this that the variations happen in those mobile phones but the technology remained the same that like it is a telephone whether it is iphone whether it is nokia phone whether it is landline phone the technology remained the same right only thing was the innovations or the variations 
and the same thing happened like lot of different variations of the pcr came uh, in the subsequent times that you can now pick up a bacterial colony and you can just put the bacterial colony itself in the tube and do the entire pcr on that multiplex pcr hot star pcr in situ pcr uh, in inverse pcr so there are different variations of the um, pcr technology which are available and each of them they have their own applications they are very very specific for some applications but due to uh, at this moment the time limitation i may not be able to cover all the techniques uh, which are mentioned here but one important technique which is very highly used and which is very important for today uh, is this real time pcr uh, which i thought i'll uh, spend a couple of minutes on this or you can also call it as a reverse transcriptase pcr like both are used in parallel and work on a principle that based on the process of reverse transcription now remember normal pcr is used to amplify dna from the samples now what happens if you want to amplify rna from the samples and why are we talking about rna at this moment the covid-19 pandemic which is going on or the corona virus it's a rna based virus its genetic material is not dna so how do we use this or for other experiments where you want to detect the rna from the sample so that uses the reverse transcription and this reverse transcription first converts rna into a dna like it makes a copy of the dna based on the rna sequence and then the process is again the same pcr that first you convert rna into dna and then do the the, the same uh, dna based pcr right and this has a much bigger advantage that you can detect very very rare or low copies of the mrna sequences by amplifying its complementary dna so how does initially uh, people used to detect rna by different methods like they used to do this northern blotting gel electrophoresis ribonuclease protection assay hybridization many many molecular biology based techniques are there these all had much bigger disadvantages of a time consuming needing lot of rna and second thing is all of us should remember that rna is very very highly prone to hydrolysis because of the two prime hydroxyl group which is present in the rna it makes it much more susceptible to degradation as compared to the dna and that is actually one of the reasons why dna is the genetic material and not the rna right so what to do like if you want to detect the rna in the samples so we can use this rt pcr technique which is very very reliable that it can discriminate closely related mrnas um, mrnas it's very very simple only one step you have to do is convert rna into dna or make a complementary copy of the dna and then it's a simple pcr right so here is the process of how does it works real time pcr monitors the fluorescence emitted during the reaction as an indicator of amplicon production at every pcr cycle as and opposed to the end point detection now how does this fluorescence technique comes from okay there are two methods by which you can uh, detect the rna amplification by incorporating either the fluorescently labeled nucleotide so the nucleotide mixtures which we are putting in the pcr a t g c you can put a fluorophore on those nucleotides and you can monitor that or there is a spray uh, there is a dye called as cyber green <coughs> or ethidium bromide these are the dyes which intercalate in the duplex dna okay <coughs> excuse me. so what happens is that the first step when you convert rna into the dna the complementary dna and then you are doing the dna amplification so the moment the dna starts to amplify more and more dye will intercalate in the dna and the fluorescence signal from that cyber green will keep increasing and by that method you can monitor the real time pcr and this is the biggest advantage is you can do pcr or like a multiplex pcr that you can use this 96 swell plates and just put them in a machine and then you can quantify the the uh, the, the increase in the dna which kind of reports the rna at in multiple samples at the same time like that is at this moment the biggest need of the day because like uh, if you see uh, the testing facilities which are there in the india the icmr facilities and all they are diagnosing or uh, like they are testing thousands of samples and where do those uh, how, how do we get those things we actually get this from this rt pcr that you get this 96 cell plate you put the uh, fluorescent dye the rna the enzymes and in those 96 cell plate and then monitor the signal 
so that at one moment you can have the data from the 96 samples and which will help us to do the high throughput uh, screening of the patient samples right so uh, this is a basic principle of the real time pcr and the general overall application of the pcrs are actually many many like you can do the molecular identification of the dna you can use it for the sequencing or you can do the genetic engineering you can induce the site directed mutagenesis <coughs> excuse me you can use it for the gene expression studies and many many more applications i will discuss a little bit about the sequencing techniques in a minute but before that let's see how the the reverse transcription a reverse transcription pcr or rt pcr is used at this moment in the covid testing facilities okay? so here is a small video i hope you all will be able to see that Uh, excuse me, sir. Yes. Uh, sir, the voice from the video, it's not audible actually on uh, YouTube. So, uh, okay. Uh, okay. Think, maybe uh, I, I think it is because of the mic. So, haan, maybe I'll maybe. remove the mic haan, for haan, the video. Exactly. And we'll. And you can start it again, sir. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Using reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction, RT PCR. Is it audible now, the voice? voice? Yes, sir. Yes. Is it okay? So, sorry, is it okay now? Yes, okay, sir. Okay now. Okay, okay, okay. Thanks, thank you. So let's have one we'll watch it once again. Okay. Using reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction, RT PCR, in COVID nineteen testing. COVID nineteen testing usually begins with a swab of the nose or throat. Saliva, mucus, or fluid from a patient's lungs can also be used. The swab of a person with COVID-19 will contain a mixture of human cells, virus particles, and other microbes. Like all living things, the human cell has DNA as the genetic material that passes on information from one generation to the next. The DNA molecule is made up of two strands that look like a twisted ladder or double helix. However, the COVID-19 virus, SARS-CoV-2, and many other viruses, including HIV, have RNA as their genetic material, genome. RNA is chemically very similar to DNA, but has only a single strand. 
The virus RNA is surrounded by a nucleocapsid protein within the virus envelope. Other proteins are embedded in the envelope itself. The SARS-CoV-2 genome contains genes, blue arrows, that carry the directions for making these and other proteins that are needed to replicate the virus inside the human cell. The objective of COVID-19 testing is to identify part of the viral genome in the patient's sample. This is usually the end gene which carries directions for making the nucleocapsid protein. There is not enough viral RNA to detect directly in the patient's sample, so a process called reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction, RT-PCR, amplifies many copies of a segment of the end gene. Short, single-stranded pieces of DNA called primers recognize unique RNA sequences within the viral genome that bracket the target region of the end gene. After the first primer binds, an enzyme called reverse transcriptase extends, synthesizes, a single-stranded DNA copy of the viral RNA, known as complementary DNA, or cDNA. After the RNA is removed, the second primer binds to the other side of the single-stranded cDNA. Then, a second enzyme, TAC DNA polymerase, extends a second strand to produce the double-stranded DNA copy of the target region of the viral RNA. This DNA copy then undergoes successive rounds, cycles of amplification, during which the DNA separates, denatures into single strands. Both primers bind, anneal, to their target sequences. TAC polymerase extends, synthesizes a new DNA strand, and so on. The number of copies of the target region of the viral genome doubles with each cycle. After 30 cycles, up to a billion DNA copies of the viral RNA are produced by PCR. In practice, the virus is typically detected with 30 to 45 cycles of PCR. Adding a fluorescent probe allows the amount of target DNA to be detected in real time and quantified after each cycle of PCR. This graph shows the detection of 200, 20, and only two virus RNA molecules in a controlled study. Results from swabs vary. A negative result is also shown. See these DNA Learning Center animations for a more detailed look at the PCR process. Okay. Okay. Was it okay? Like, uh, oh, yeah. was it okay? The the video. Um, Yes, sir. Yes, was, sir. Was it audible? Yeah, it was audible. Okay. Great. So I hope uh, I gave a like a small clue or a small uh, visualization of how uh, these days the viral sampling uh, testing is done using uh, the simple PCR machine, right? And like if there is no viral DNA, you saw the fluorescence will remain flat, and that will tell us that the result is negative. And we hope that very soon all the results are negative, the curves are flat. So yeah, with that, uh, let's move now to the second part of the talk which is the DNA sequencing. Now, the principle of it remains the same, that we are going to do the PCR, but then we are now going to bring some more components in it. Like when I say sequencing, we are interested in finding what is the arrangement of the nucleotides in the given DNA sample. Now, what happened is, like let me connect it again to the real world example, that coronavirus, <clears throat> That virus was detected in China, spread to the Europe, came to India, and not all the vaccines are uh, like successful against the virus. Like one of the reasons is that the virus is also mutating, and it is changing its strains. When we say that the strain is changed of the virus, that one strain in China, the viral strain in China is different from the virus in India, we actually mean that the RNA sequence of this is changed like some there are some mutations in the virus this uh, vi viral rna now in order to detect or find the vaccine against them the thing is we need to see what is what are those changes and in order to do that we need a method called as the sequencing by which we can find out the sequence of the dna or the rna and then we can find out some methods to study that find drugs against it and other things so this is how a classical sequencing result look like 
the DNA sequencing result looks like. We use four colors. Okay, for at this moment, just remember four colors. A adenosine or adenine is green in color. Thymine is red in color. Cytosine is blue in color, and guanine is G in color. Okay, just remember these four colors. And based on the peaks in the gram, uh, histogram, we will tell that what is the sequence of the DNA. So I will show you how are the uh, DNA sequencing there. But before that, let's see what is uh, DNA sequencing. So it is a process of determining the order of the nucleotides, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine along the DNA strands. We need to know the order of nucleotide bases in the D strand of DNA for sequencing. And all the information required for the growth and development of the organism is encoded in the DNA of its genome, right? So DNA sequence is indeed needed for the genome analysis uh, to understand the biological processes in general, diseases, like if there are mutations in some of those genes, like the sickle cell anemia, which is one of the biggest disease caused by the mutation in the uh, gene encoding the hemoglobin protein, and so on and so forth, the DNA sequencing is kind of important. So what are the different methods by which we can identify the DNA sequence? There are two main methods uh, which are used. One is the Sanger chain termination sequencing method. This is the most used method in the day-to-day -day technologies. Like most companies and most laboratories in the world are using Sanger chain termination sequencing method. And there is another one which is not that popularly used, which is this Maxim and Gilbert uh, uh, gene sequencing method, which is the chemical modification of the DNA. Right? These are the most popular conventional methods, but even out of them, at this moment, all the automated sequencing, which is done in the laboratories and in the companies, uh, they all use the Sanger sequencing method, uh, a modified version of it, which is the Illumina. I will show it in a minute. And these days, we have different robotics and automated sequencing methods to do like sequencing for hundreds of strains of the, the viruses and the living organisms. Like for example, yesterday, uh, if some of you are following the news, uh, that we have this Gujarat State Biotechnology Mission, which is this GSBTM in Gandhinagar, they succeeded in sequencing 100 different strains of the coronavirus. I'm sure there must be some facility like this in Rajasthan or uh, other states of the country. And there are dedicated ICMR laboratories all over the country which do the sequencing of the samples of the DNA, right? So this is uh, the, the most used method, the Sanger uh, chain termination method. It is a PCR-based method. And what we do is we use a little bit of a modification in this. <clears throat> Remember one thing, that when we add those NTPs in the... PCR machine, all those NTPs are deoxyribonucleic acid, right? So this is this DNTP, which we use in the classical PCR. And what we will do is, in this case, in the Sanger's method, we'll do the same PCR, but instead of adding the DNTPs, we will add di-deoxynucleotides. So the, here it is, if there was one more OH, it would have been NTP. Since there is not one OH is missing, we call it as a DNTP. And here we will use it as a di deoxynucleotide uh, in the PCR machine. So, sorry, I apologize. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So, this was a 3 prime OH, which is in the normal uh, normal nucleotide. And this 3 prime OH, hydroxyl group of the nucleotide above, will attack the 5 prime phosphate group of the DNA, which is uh, the nucleotide, which is just oh, And this way, it will keep on elongating the chain in the PCR. So, this is the 3 prime OH. This will attack the phosphate. This will leave this PO minus group will leave and you will get the chain extension in the PCR. But suppose at one point, this OH is missing in the nucleotide. So there is not 3 prime hydroxyl group to attack this phosphorylation. And hence, during the PCR, at this point, the chain elongation will not happen. It will terminate. And we can get a very truncated version of the DNA. Right? And by this, we can actually find out that at what points the DNA chain extension stopped, and what was the nucleotide which caused this stoppage? So the process is this. For uh, doing the gene sequencing, you need actually a little more amount of DNA. So you have to first amplify the DNA by the PCR, and then collect this DNA, which you have it in good amounts, divide it into four tubes. So the same parent DNA is divided into the four tubes, and each tube we are going to add the primers, the same tag polymerase, the template DNA, single-sided DNA, everything is same as the PCR. 
what we are changing is this di deoxynucleotide protein in one tube we will add dd atp in second tube we will add dd gtp dd ctp and dd ttp now in a tube in the test tube where we have added this dd atp the reaction will stop when this dd atp is incorporated in the uh, in the tag polymerase if the tag polymerase is going to uh, like it, if it sees that at one side this d d d a t p is uh, attached on the dna the reaction will not for that like it will not uh, go forward right so we are going to use this trick d d a t p g t p c t p and t t p and then we will find out at what points along the dna length did the reaction stop and that will tell you that at this point it was a at this point it was g at this point it was c and at this point it was t and by this we can actually come up with the sequence of the dna i, I will show you how do we do it so run the pcr like the classical pcr of all the four test tubes and then you run these samples on the gel electrophoresis and this one looks like this so let's say here is your big piece of dna the black is the template okay and this is the sequence which we want to identify like this is a piece of dna which we want to sequence t c g a c g g g c okay and this is a primer which has the three prime end because the polymerase will grow the dna in this direction okay and then we have added di deoxynucleotides in four tubes separately so with the addition of the enzyme the tag dna polymerase the primer is extended until this dd ntp is encountered and the chain will end with the incorporation of this dd ntp and with the proper ratio of d ntp and dd ntp the chain will the chain will terminate throughout the length of the template at any random points at any point where there is dd ntp the chain will stop and then all the terminated chains will end in the dd ntp added to that reaction so i'll show you how this works so let's say i'll, I'll show you with an example let's say this is the piece of a dna which we want to uh, sequence uh, so you first denature the sequence and use only the forward primer for this stand so this was the parent sequence okay now what i told you is that we will divide this dna into four tubes and then we will do the reaction suppose in tube number 1 i have added dd ttp so now the primer the polymerase starts to now the uh, the polymerase starts to read the sequence and at this point where you have a it will incorporate t but suppose if there is dd ttp the reaction will not forward like it will not move right so this reaction will stop here suppose this was normal t and at this point a complementary t this ddt uh, this uh, dd ttp is incorporated so you, the chain will stop here right so we will get two products in this pcr t similarly here if i put dd atp the reaction will stop at this point at this point at this point at this point where am and pcr reaction will stop same for cdp same for dd gtp okay now you collect all these four tubes and run it on a gel okay maybe i'll just show you a small video acting is the process of working out the order of the building blocks or bases in a strand of dna is the video audible ma'am uh yes sir it's audible sir one more request Uh, okay. There is a tab which is yes, showing you. this at the uh, end of the screen. Meet dot com is sharing your screen. You just please hide that. Yeah. Okay. Some participants yeah. are required. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Before we can sequence the DNA, it has to be cut up into smaller pieces that are inserted into plasmid DNA and then put into bacterial cells. This makes it possible to produce lots and lots of copies of it as the bacterial cells multiply. The DNA is then isolated from the bacteria and sent for sequencing. The isolated DNA is transferred to a plate where the sequencing reaction will take place. A mixture of ingredients is added. These include free DNA bases A C G T DNA polymerase enzyme 
and DNA primers. Modified DNA bases labeled with colored fluorescent tags are also added. These are called terminator bases. To start the sequencing reaction, everything is heated to 96 degrees Celsius. This separates the DNA into two single strands. The temperature is then lowered to 50 degrees. This enables the DNA primers to bind to the plasmid DNA. The temperature is then increased to 60 degrees and the enzyme DNA polymerase binds to the primer DNA. DNA polymerase starts making a new strand of DNA by adding unlabeled DNA bases to the target DNA. It continues to add DNA bases until a terminator base is added. These terminator bases have been chemically altered so that no more bases can be added to the new strand of DNA. Once a terminator base is added, the DNA polymerase enzyme stops making DNA and falls away from the strand. Everything is then heated to 96 degrees Celsius again to separate the new DNA strand from the original strand. This process of heating and cooling is repeated again and again to produce lots of fragments of DNA of different lengths. The length of each fragment depends on when a terminator base got added. DNA, the various fragments are separated by length using a process called electrophoresis. A capillary tube is lowered into each well of the plate and an electrical charge is applied. This causes the negatively charged DNA molecules to move through the capillary tube. Each capillary contains a porous gel. The shorter fragments of DNA move through the gel more easily than the longer DNA fragments. As a result, the fragments become arranged by size from the shortest to the longest. As the DNA fragments come to the end of the capillary, a laser makes the terminator bases light up. The color is detected by a camera and recorded. Each terminator base is labeled with a different color. A, fluoresces green. C, blue. G, yellow. And T, red. The shortest DNA fragments will be red first and the longest red last. The sequencing machine records the color of the terminator bases as a series of colored blocks. Each colored block represents the labeled terminator base at the end of each fragment of DNA. By converting the colors into letters, we get the sequence of our piece of DNA. Okay, was it a good? Like, was it audible the video? Uh, no. Yes, sir, it was audible. Hello? Yes, sir, yes, sir, it was audible. Okay, 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 Good. thanks. So, Thank I you. hope uh, I was able to make the message clear that how we read the, the sequencing. So, by incorporating those DDNTPs at different ratios, either by gel electrophoresis or by putting a fluorophore on that, we can read the sequence of the DNA, right? So, this was the Sanger's uh, method which has been used at this moment universally. Uh, in the in the laboratories and in the industries. The second method is not very well used, but it's still uh, valid, which is this Maxim Gilbert sequencing of the method, in which this method is based on the nucleobase specific partial chemical modifications of the DNA, and then subsequent cleavage of the DNA backbone at the sites adjacent to the modified nucleotides. Like this was very old, like discovered in 1976, 
and a very classical method where we used to cut the DNA by chemicals and then run it on a gel. But this becomes a bit tedious these days. Most for the Sanger's method, you saw that you just have to modify your fluorophore with a uh, sorry, you modify your nucleotide with a fluorophore, and automatically the detector will read uh, the, the 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 nucleotide. And this has a single nucleotide resolution, so you can easily get the sequencing based on the Sanger's method. But nonetheless, let's see the the Gilbert's method. So in this one, Maxim Gilbert's method, we first modify the DNA at the five prime end. So using classical ATP, you can put a radio label ATP and you can put the radioactive label on the 5 prime end or a fluorophore uh, uh, on the 5 prime end of the DNA and aliquot the DNA sample in the four tubes. And in each four tube, you have to make different base modification reaction. Like there are some reactions which are very, very specific for A, some reactions specific for T, some for G and some for C. And then you have to perform the gel electrophoresis or auto radiography since it uses a radioactive level uh, and then study the results, right? So there are very specific uh, modifications of uh, the DNA. So for example, like you, you can, so let's say this is the sequence of the DNA, which we want to sequence. And what I will do is at the five prime end, I will put the radioactive uh, P. Just by mixing this DNA with uh, radio level ATP, I will uh, do the phosphorylation of the DNA at the five prime end. And then I will do the modifications of the DNA strand. So one biggest method which has been used for base modifications is this dimethyl sulfide, DMS. So DMS normally modifies only guanine. Okay. So if you do the reaction of DMS, wherever there is guanine, there will be cleavage of the DNA. Or if you use DMS plus formic acid, it will cleave at G or A. Wherever there is adenine or guanine, it will cleave. And you can clean the sugar phosphate backbone using a chemical called as pyperidine. So you have to break those DNA bases, uh, uh, DNA strands, and then run it on a gel. For cytosin and thymine, we have another reaction, hydrazine. So hydrazine will cleave, uh, modify cytosine or thymine, and hydrazine, hydrazine uh, plus sodium chloride will modify only cytosine. And then again, using pyperidine, you have to break the DNA and run it on the gel. So for example, here was this double standard. You can denature, get the single standard DNA and um, modify it at the 5 prime end by the radio label, do the uh, P32 ATP and then cleave at different uh, specific nucleotides by using those chemicals which I showed you that um, by uh, by DMS, DMS plus formic acid, hydrazine and hydrazine plus sodium chloride and then you will get different uh, strands of the DNA which are broken at the sites of those chemically modified nucleotides. And then you can run the gel. So you have those four, uh, four um, here is actually. So you have those four tubes where we have modified by different chemicals, either A or G or G, C and C plus C alone. And if you run it on a gel, you will get different ladders. And then when you combine them, you will get the sequence of the DNA. So this is a very, very classical method of using uh, the maximum Gilbert sequencing not used at this moment uh, in the laboratories. Like we don't use this method because A, it involves the radioactive labeling of the DNA. Like most laboratories at this moment don't use radioactivity. Uh, second thing is you have to modify the DNA uh, with the chemicals. Now, if you see, there are two chemicals. One is this DMS, which is specific for G and C. But at this moment, there is no chemical which is specific for A or T. You will always get C plus T or A plus G which kind of adds to confusion. So it's better that not to use this method. And uh, we, uh, all the laboratories at this moment use the Sanger's method because it's very, very easy. And we have this automated machines. Now, the same video which I showed you before by how we do the sequencing, uh, it has been modified now to something called as next generation sequencing, where you can now detect single nucleotide changes in the DNA and at the same time, you can do it for multiple samples at the same time. So the principle behind the next generation sequencing is similar to that of the Sanger sequencing, which relies on the capillary electrophoresis. And the genomic strand is fragmented. And the basis in which the fragment is identified by emitted signals when the fragments are ligated against a small template strand. So I will show you how this NGS is different from the classical Sanger sequencing. So let's quickly go to a small video 
So it needs uh, small changes as compared to the Sanger's method. But what we do is, let's say you have different pieces of the DNA from the plasmid, from the gene, and you want to study them. So we make it and coat them with small primers. These are the primers which are specific to the different regions of the DNA. So when you add your DNA to those 96 cell plates, wherever there are the primers which are complementary to the DNA, they will capture them. Okay, And then we will do the same Sanger sequencing and then do the capillary electrophoresis to identify which are the pieces of DNA present in those uh, 96 cell plates. So these are like here uh, the advantages that you can do it in the 96 cell plate with different primers. So you can process like millions of reactions in parallel uh, resulting in high speed and throughput at a very reduced cost. So this is the same Sanger sequencing, but now used at a high throughput way. Uh, so we call it as the next generation sequencing. So you need uh, libraries, like these are the libraries which are created using random fragmentation of the DNA, followed by ligation with the custom linkers. And then we amplify this library using uh, clonal PCR, and then we sequence using the Sanger uh, method. So maybe I'll quick, I'll skip this for a minute because these are kind of um, uh, like, um, um, just technical details. I will show you a small video of the NGS, next generation sequence, uh, since we are also running a bit late on the time, and then we amplify. So I'll just quickly uh, skip this. And how this Illumina sequencing or the next generation sequencing works is uh, similar to Sanger sequencing, which we saw. But what happens is this. So you have, maybe let me just quickly show you this video before we go ahead. The Illumina sequencing workflow is composed of four basic steps. Sample prep, cluster generation, sequencing, and data analysis. There are a number of different ways to prepare samples. All preparation methods add adapters to the ends of the DNA fragments. Through reduced cycle amplification, additional motifs are introduced, such as the sequencing binding site, indices, and regions complementary to the flow cell oligos. Clustering is a process where each fragment molecule is isothermally amplified. The flow cell is a glass slide with lanes. Each lane is a channel coated with a lawn, composed of two types of oligos. Hybridization is enabled by the first of the two types of oligos on the surface. This oligo is complementary to the adapter region on one of the fragment strands. A polymerase creates a complement of the hybridized fragment. The double-stranded molecule is denatured, and the original template is washed away. The strands are clonally amplified through bridge amplification. In this process, the strand folds over and the adapter region hybridizes to the second type of oligo on the flow cell. Polymerases generate the complementary strand, forming a double-stranded bridge. This bridge is denatured, resulting in two single-stranded copies of the molecule that are tethered to the flow cell. The process is then repeated over and over and occurs simultaneously for millions of clusters, resulting in clonal amplification of all the fragments. After the bridge amplification, the reverse strands are cleaved and washed off, leaving only the forward strands. The three prime ends are blocked to prevent unwanted priming. Sequencing begins with the extension of the first sequencing primer to produce the first read. With each cycle, fluorescently tagged nucleotides compete for addition to the growing chain. Only one is incorporated based on the sequence of the template. After the addition of each nucleotide, the clusters are excited by a light source, and a characteristic fluorescent signal is emitted. This proprietary process is called sequencing by synthesis. The number of cycles determines the length of the read. The emission wavelength, along with the signal intensity, determines the base call. For a given cluster, all identical strands are read simultaneously. Hundreds of millions of clusters are sequenced in a massively parallel process. This image represents a small fraction of the flow cell. 
After the completion of the first read, the read product is washed away. In this step, the index one read primer is introduced and hybridized to the template. The read is generated similar to the first read. After completion of the index read, the read product is washed off and the three prime ends of the template are deprotected. The template now folds over and binds the second oligo on the flow cell. Index two is read in the same manner as index one. Polymerases extend the second flow cell oligo forming a double stranded bridge. This double stranded DNA is then linearized and the three prime ends are blocked. The original forward strand is cleaved off and washed away, leaving only the reverse strand. Read two begins with the introduction of the read two sequencing primer. As with read one, the sequencing steps are repeated until the desired read length. The read two product is then washed away. This entire process generates millions of reads representing all the fragments. Sequences from pooled sample libraries are separated based on the unique indices introduced during the sample preparation. For each sample, reads with similar stretches of base calls are locally clustered. Forward and reverse reads are paired, creating contiguous sequences. These contiguous sequences are aligned back to the reference genome for variant identification. The paired end information is used to resolve ambiguous alignments. Genomic data can be securely transferred, stored, analyzed, and shared in BaseSpace Sequence Hub. Discover the possibilities. Okay, so uh, this like video which we saw, the next generation sequencing is ex exactly based on the Sanger sequencing method, where in Sanger sequencing, we first um, we put those uh, fluorescently labeled NTPs and then we pass different fragments of the DNA through the capillary electrophoresis and detect. In this case, what happens is that we do single nucleotide addition to the DNA and this single nucleotide addition of the DNA gives a signal which will like directly tell you that okay, A is added, T is added, G is added and that has much more better advantages over the Sanger's uh, sequencing method. And this And here, as I said, that you can use the microfabricated chamber where you can put uh, hybridized multiples of the DNA primers and then catch different sequences of the DNA and do the sequencing in a high throughput manner. So this is uh, the commercial device which is available at this moment. In all the laboratories use Illumina sequencing which can give you automated sequences readily. And you can like do hundreds of sequences in parallel using this Illumina sequencing method. So this is the basic principle of the Sanger's uh, gene sequencing and Maxim Gilbert sequence. And this was uh, kind of the objective which I thought uh, I will present uh, it in today's talk. Like both the methods use PCR uh, as a technology and I hope that in today's lecture I was able to show you how the PCR works and how does this sequencing works. Like I agree one hour is very less time to explain these principles but I tried my best to keep it as simple and uh, uh, the possible to keep pass the message across in one hour for these two techniques. So with this, I'll stop here. Uh, if there are any questions, we can have a word or any, uh, as uh, as a schedule group. Okay, so uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for such an informative and nice lecture. I think all the participants have enjoyed. I can see it in the comment box as well. Okay, okay. We have, sir, a few questions. Which yes, please. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the first question is from Mr. Avinash. He mm. wanted to know what is the relevance of sequencing of PCR product for both forward and reverse primers? Mm. One is, so, both method, PCR and sequencing, they have error rates. Like, there is no um, uh, accuracy rate, 100% accurate. It's always good to sequence both forward and the reverse primer to check A, the, the accuracy, and second, if there are some mutations in the genes. So we can actually detect the point mutations using sequencing both the primers. These are the two main reasons for sequencing both, the forward and the reverse primer. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is from uh, Mr. Anurag Mathur. 
uh, it's about the cause uh, covid 19 positive cases like how yeah. to deal with these positive cases that are still positive with pcr very close to upper limit of long time the answer is not related to pcr at this moment uh, how to deal with it you just have to like isolate the, like isolate the patient and keep giving him treatment unless the virus go away like that's the only option at this moment um, unfortunately like uh, like nowadays what hospitals are doing is that using the same pcr technique if the titer goes below let's say uh, what what we saw in that video that if there is zero virus no signal two virus little bit signal 20 virus little bit signal so if the signal goes below threshold the patient is fine like we understand that there is enough antibodies or immune response in the patient that now uh, 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 the patient is safe and that's the only way we are monitoring just see that the pcr level uh, the positive signal goes down that that's it okay thank you sir uh, the next question is from mr krishna rana how is covid 19 virus detected using rt pcr rt yeah so you take the saliva sample from the patient okay and then there is a kit by which there is a buffer by which you can isolate the rna so you break the virus you remove the proteins rna is isolated and then you put it in the 96 cell plate this pcr kit where the enzyme reverse polymerase reverse transcriptase will make a complementary copy of the dna based on this viral rna and then you do the pcr if the pcr result is positive if there is amplification we can tell that yes this is coronavirus uh, rna if the pcr result is negative that there is no amplification we say that this test is negative at, the, at this moment this is the only way we use second method uh, is the elisa based method where we use the antibody against the viral coat protein which uh, can detect which can give a visible signal a colorimetric signal uh, since the antibody is hrv coupled but that method is expensive uh, at this moment antibody based elisa method is expensive and i don't know if in india we are still using the antibody based test kits okay. us and europe they are doing but india pcr is doing well so uh, may i interrupt you in between uh, like sir could you uh, stop sharing uh, your screen okay so, okay yeah Mm-hmm. Yeah, now you are visible in a better okay. way. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So sir, the next question is from Dr. Pranita Bhatele. Like, end gene for all viruses are different. Can yes. there be a false detection due to similarity of end gene of other viruses present in the nasal swab? Yes, it's possible. Yeah, absolutely, this is possible. But at this moment, we are the the primers which we are using. Uh, uh they are very very specific against the coronavirus sequence just remember one thing the coronavirus is not a new virus coronavirus has been there for some time we already know the the genomic rna sequence of it so the primers which we are detecting at this moment we are that the amplification is happening because of the covid virus so the only two viruses which are very close to it is the flu virus and the, the one more uh, but at this moment uh, we are quite sure that this is indeed a coronavirus specific amplification uh, thank you sir so one more question from krishna rana how to determine yes. annealing temperature for primers <laughs> very simple you like whenever a forms a watson crick base pair with t or g forms a watson crick base pair with c there is a specific thermal energy needed delta g and every delta g has a temperature to it so if you say that the primer has 10 base pairs so you can calculate that temperatures or calculate the total delta g and that will tell you the temperature of it and based on that you can calculate what is annealing temperature these days we have automated softwares so when you purchase a primer from the company the company will itself tell you that for this primer the melting temperature is this or the annealing temperature is this so we have softwares to do uh, do that even when we i think design the primers then the yeah. annealing temperature is yeah. shown in the software there also yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah there absolutely is a difference yeah. i think between uh, when we get uh, synthesized yeah. and the software but still it's available there yes thank absolutely yeah, yeah. thank you so the next question is from ms shreya mishra is reverse yeah. transcriptase and real time pcr different Uh, there, there are two. Yeah, the principle is different, but the way we are working it. So yes, in principle, there are two different methods. If you just do reverse transcriptase, you can make a DNA out of it and full stop. So then you call it as a reverse transcriptase. But then when you are amplifying it, it becomes a real time. Right. 
so like it's a high pressure hplc whether you call it high pressure or high performance so, so same thing is same there thing, right so the next question is from mr anurag mathur why rt pcr is preferred over loop mediated isothermal amplification lamp for covid 19 diagnosis yeah so covid 19 if you see this the the rna of the virus is not big okay so the loop formation which happens it needs a threshold dna length for it to form a proper loop viral rna is not that big um, actually i don't recall the exact sequence number but it's very small rna so uh, for this small piece of rna you don't need you cannot form the loop of it so a simple uh, sanger sequencing is enough uh thank you sir uh next yeah. question is uh from mr avinash should gene expression determined by rna sequence be controlled by real time pcr uh, uh, sorry i did, did not get the question uh, should uh, gene expression determined by rna sec be controlled by real time pcr um, i don't think so <laughs> but maybe I, i'm not understanding the question that gene expression controlled uh, like, maybe maybe can the can uh, Uh, if mr avinash is there please uh, okay. could you yeah, explain the question yeah, yeah. Uh, okay we are moving ahead if you will get yes, you can contact yeah. contact them yeah, actually uh, i have another class in few minutes so maybe okay. uh, like if you can one or two questions sure sure thank you thank you sir uh, i will just yeah. select a few questions sure, like sure. Uh, the key questions the key questions yeah discuss. exactly sir how much length of dna can be sequenced by sanger's method it was by ms yeah. gauri thakre yeah yeah so uh, the, the 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 minimum which has been sequenced is few kilo base pairs like uh, up to 1 kb is a minimum large like at this moment people have done sequencing for some uh, mega base pairs as well can we go up to giga base pairs i don't know like at least in my knowledge no but what happens is when you do the sequencing you anyway cut Uh, the different pieces of the dna and the pieces of the dna you don't you always get mega base pairs dna which is enough for the sequencing okay. thank you sir last question yeah. uh, like sure. we have a long list but okay we will be taking the last question yeah. by ms yeah. anita yes, yadav uh, why only primers bind to single stranded dna during annealing step and why not two parent dna strands get joined hmm. interesting question i guess yeah yeah, yeah. absolutely right question what happens is that for the long pieces of dna to bind it will be a slow process right now in the pcr what we are doing is like very very good question that the annealing time which we are giving is the it's very small like 5 to 15 minutes now that time is only enough for the small piece of primer to bind to the big dna sequence had this time been one hour you could have even seen the parents dna hybridizing so we we make sure that the timing we are controlling in the pcr that uh, the main parent cells don't anneal only the primers anneal and then the reaction moves fast i think uh, all the participants who have questioned they must have been satisfied with your answers and sir, okay. on behalf of all the participants and our organizing team i would like to thank you sir for sparing uh, time yeah. from your busy schedule and uh, yeah. delivering my, my such an informative yeah. lecture for all of us Thank you, thank you. I, I I'm sure I went a bit fast, but if there are any queries, uh, people can write emails, and I'll be happy to respond by emails. Okay, uh, no problem. Although uh, further help is needed, I'll be happy to help. Okay, okay. okay. Thank you. Sir. Okay, thank you, thank, thank you very you. much. Yeah. See. You. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.